John chapter 13. I invite you to turn with me there, John chapter 13. Next Sunday, of course, is Easter Sunday. We've already talked about that. We look forward to the glorious celebration of the triumphant resurrection of our Savior. But I want us to meditate today on one aspect of His ministry that really summarizes or sums up His entire ministry here on earth. Jesus Himself said it in Matthew 20 and verse 28, That the Son of Man, which is how he most often referred to himself, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Not to be served, but to serve. And if, if laying down his life was the supreme example, the supreme manifestation, the greatest display of his humble service laying down his life for us so that we could be reconciled to God, if that was the supreme uh, example, then perhaps one of his next greatest examples of humble service came just the night before he was hung on a cross. And we find this in John 13. Look with me there, if you would. John 13, beginning in verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover... When Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing You do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, for he's completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I've entitled this message today, How Dirty Is Your Towel? We live in a society, a culture that is bombarded with marketing and advertising that screams, you need this, you deserve this, this will make you happy and you have a right to be happy. You should have whatever it takes to make you happy and by the way, you can have it for two easy payments of $19.95. Marketing and advertising directs your focus towards you, towards your felt needs, your comforts, your pleasures. But our text today shows that Christ came to direct our focus towards others and their needs. I want you to notice, first of all, that serving is grounded in what I know to be true. Look right at the very beginning there. What does it say about Jesus when Jesus knew 
that his hour had come to depart out of this world, he knew. What are the things he knew? He knew that his time or his hour had come. We see throughout the gospel accounts as the Pharisees, the scribes, and others that hated Jesus and were constantly trying to oppose him and do him in, do harm to him, and ultimately kill him. That was their agenda for a while. And throughout all their attempts, it kept saying, we kept seeing this phrase occur, his hour had not yet come, his hour had not yet come, his time had not yet come. But now Jesus knows that his hour has come. What did he know? That his hour had come? He knew that the reason for which he had come to this earth was now at hand and he would soon be returning to his father. He had loved his disciples, it says. He loved them to the end. In other words, to their fullest extent. And he wasn't going to stop loving them now. His love for them had no limits. We sang it earlier about the deep, deep love of Jesus. His love will never end. His love for his disciples had no limits as the next 24 hours was going to unfold and show. What else did he know? He knew the treachery that Satan had already implanted in the heart of Judas, verse 2, to betray him. He also knew and was fully aware of his divine authority. He knew of his divine origin, not in the sense of his beginning, but in the sense of where he came from. He had come from his Father, from heaven. And he knew where he was going. He knew everything that was about to unfold in the next 12 to 24 hours. It was not as though Jesus was an innocent victim. He he was innocent, to be sure. He had not sinned. But he was not an innocent victim and, and caught up in some plot of reprehensible and unjust cruelty of which he had no idea about and just uh, uh, found himself in. No. No. This was the Father's plan from eternity past, and the Son knew it and was in full submission to it. He knew it full well. This knowledge of what was going to unfold in the, next, in the coming hours did not deter him from his incredible act of service of dying in our place on the cross. No, this knowledge of all these things did not keep him from it. Rather, it fueled him to it. This was the basis for which he served so humbly. Because, you see, he knew that this was the only way that you and I and others could be made right with God, was through his atoning sacrifice on the cross the next day. But he also knew that just beyond the cross and just beyond the grave was a glorious resurrection awaiting him and a triumphant return to his father's side. And so what he knew to be true, all of these things that we've just mentioned, were the very basis for which he then does what he does here for his disciples in great humility. Friends, when you and I grasp the truth, when we really get who we are, sinners saved by amazing grace, where we have come from, the the sinful baggage and background that we all have, where we have come from, when we get why we are here on this earth to praise Him, bring glory to God by pointing others to Him, and when we understand where we are going, we've sung about it this morning, that we are going to be reunited with Christ and our loved ones who have gone ahead of us in Christ. When we understand these things, this ought to fuel our serving God by serving his people and serving others. We are children of God. We've been mercifully bought out of the slavery of sin, and we have become his children. We will spend eternity with him in the new heaven and new earth that he creates, forever praising and worshiping him. And our purpose here is simple. It's not easy, but it is simple. The sole purpose for which he has left us here on this earth after he makes us his children is to do the one thing that you and I will not be able to do in heaven, and that is point people to Jesus Christ so they can come into relationship with him or they can grow in their relationship with him. We can't do it in heaven. We'll all be perfect. We will be like him, for we will see him as he is. That's the one thing we can't do. That is our purpose here. And so when we grasp this, serving others not only makes sense, 
but because it becomes a priority. That's what we're here for. Bernard of Clairvaux was a French uh, monk in the uh, 12th century. And he said, humility can only be the result of knowing and believing the truth. That is to say, having the right notions about God and about myself. Understanding the truth about God, understanding the truth about myself and why he has me here will lead us to serve other people. Serving is grounded in what I know to be true. But notice, secondly, not only is it grounded in what I know to be true, it's an outgrowth of humility. Look at verse 4. Jesus rose from supper, knowing all of this stuff, the knowledge of what is true, led him to rise from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. He poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. And to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. This meeting of Christ with his 12 disciples in what we know as the upper room the night before he was betrayed and crucified the next morning was likely a meeting in secrecy. Jesus was a wanted man at this point. There were lots of people looking for him to put him to death. And the account we read in Luke 22 gives us the sense that this is a private secret meeting so they won't be found. Thus, the room is a deserted room. It was prepared. It was prepared for them, but there was nobody there prior to their coming. So there was no household servant or slave there who would do the customary task of when you had guests come into your house, they would remove their sandals and and the, the servant would wash their feet. That was normal. That was a normal custom. Because they had dusty streets. And there was no one here to do that. It was standard procedure and proper etiquette to wash your guests' feet before you shared a meal together. So in the absence of a uh, household servant or slave, the disciples, any one of them should have jumped in and said, Hey, I'll wash everyone's feet since there was no one there to do that. But, but what's interesting also in Luke's account, Luke 22, what have the disciples just been talking about on their way in? They've been talking about which one of them is the greatest. Who would be the greatest in the kingdom, in Christ's kingdom? Not really the kind of discussion you want to have to, to put you in the mood to then bend down and wash everybody else's feet. Because to do so would suggest that you're inferior to them, and, and you've just been arguing that you're going to be the greatest. What I find very interesting as I studied this, the disciples, it was, it was beneath them to stoop down and wash each other's feet and even their own Lord's, the Master, Christ's feet. That was beneath them. No one was willing to do it. And yet, do you remember the words three years earlier at the beginning of his ministry when John the Baptist was out preaching in the wilderness and baptizing and Christ came? And do you remember what John the Baptist said about Jesus? He said, here comes the Lamb of God to take away the sins of the world. I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. John the Baptist said, I'm not worthy to untie his sandals. The Bible says, it's beneath me to get down and wash his feet. Since none of the twelve would do it, and in order to provide the twelve... And to provide the rest of us another tremendous example of humble servitude, Jesus Christ, creator of the universe, master of all, does the unthinkable. He took off his outer garment, wraps a towel around his waist, put water in a basin, and stoops to wash the feet of the disciples. This would have looked like the household slave that the average Jew would have looked down upon. And yet, it was Christ. Why could he do it? Because he had no image to protect. The guys were protecting their image. I'm going to be one of the greatest. Jesus had no image to protect. He wasn't concerned about what the others in the room thought about him like they were at that point. 
He had no ulterior motive. Hey, guys, I'm going to need all of you to, uh, to fight with me here pretty soon, so I'm going to get down and wash your feet, your feet and ingratiate you to, to me. He wasn't hoping to get their unfailing allegiance in washing their feet because, in fact, in the very next few hours, one of those guys whose feet he was washing would betray him. One of those guys whose feet he was washing would deny him, and the rest of them would all desert him. In spite of that, even knowing what was about to happen, in love and humility, he saw a need that needed to be met, and he met it. Humility is willing to put others' comforts and others' needs ahead of my own. Well, I'd a lot rather be doing this this afternoon, but, but you can serve down here. Or you can go visit somebody, or you can go do something for somebody. But, but, but you don't understand. You don't know what I got. Humility is willing to put others' comforts and needs ahead of my own. Humility resists the urge to build myself up, to make myself comfortable, to make my name great, and instead seeks to build up other people. Humility seeks to direct people to Christ by serving them rather than insisting that they serve me. Serving is the natural response of a truly humble heart. Serving is an outgrowth of humility. And Christ is our supreme example. But notice also, serving is often misunderstood. Verse 6, he came to Simon Peter and said, Lord, do you wash my feet? And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any share with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not, not my feet only, but all my, also my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That's why he said, not all of you are clean. Many of us know about Peter and how brash he was, how impetuous he was. He often spoke, often acted without giving much thought to what he was about to say or do. And here is no exception. He does it again. Incredulous, he asks, Lord, you, you, you're going to wash my feet? I can imagine by this point it's beginning to sink into some of these guys. Uh, guys, someone, somebody else should be doing this besides him. And now the guilt is setting in. Um, I should have gotten down and done this, and now he's washing my feet. No, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? And, and in fairness to Peter, okay, the other guys are thinking something along these lines probably because of the guilt. They just weren't brave enough to object like Peter did. But Peter is also showing high regard for his Lord who shouldn't be the one down there washing the feet. Should have been one of them. If only everyone else had thought the same thing sooner and gotten down themselves. Jesus responded by assuring Peter that though you don't understand this right now, the day will come when you will understand it, Peter. And so Peter's bold answer shows how badly he misunderstood what Jesus is saying. Some of our translations say, um, mine here, the ESV says, you shall never wash my feet, but, but what's not picked up on in some of our translations, the, the NIV picks it up very well, is as a double negative. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. He was emphatic. This, this isn't right. <laughs> but Jesus humbly says, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have any share with me. You're not part of me. You don't belong to me. And here again, Jesus is correcting their, the wrong view that he had come as a political Messiah to rescue them from Rome. That's not why he came. He came to save people from sin. And so he must humble himself just like he was here. He must serve instead of be served. And then he must give his life a ransom for many, which is what he was going to do the very next day. But he was also showing his disciples that to be restored to him... One must be washed. Being washed is a common theme in the Old Testament and the New Testament. 
for being spiritually cleansed from our sin. Peter still didn't get it. He still misunderstood. And, and, and since he didn't want to be separated from Christ, he says, just, just give me a whole bath. Bathe all of me. <laughs> and Jesus assured Peter, hey, those who have already bathed don't need a whole bath. You just need your feet clean. You're just out walking on the dusty streets. You just need your feet clean. But again, metaphorically, Jesus is equating that full bath, being completely clean with salvation, being cleansed from your sin. And he says, you all are. In other words, they were all saved. They were all cleansed of their sin and just needed their feet washed now, except one. And we know who that one was, Judas, who would betray him, who was a tool in the hand of Satan to bring Jesus to death. Satan had put it in his heart, we're told. Jesus was demonstrating his divine knowledge because the other 11 knew nothing about Judas. They had no clue about what was in Judas' heart and what would unfold in the next few hours. Friends, oftentimes our attempts to help people, to serve them, to help meet needs, it oftentimes gets misunderstood. People impugn our motives. They think that we want something in return or we're expecting something in return, and so that's why we're doing what we're doing. Or we have a certain agenda, and we want to get them on our side in the agenda. They may not even want our help. They may think we're insulting them by helping them. I can do it on my own. I don't need your help. And some people have that mentality. It's not a good mentality. We need to be willing to be helped. God knows we need help. That's why he's given us the body of Christ. They may be embarrassed that they have a need. And the fact that you know they have a need and you're trying to help meet that need makes them further embarrassed. Maybe they dislike or disagree with your method of going about trying to help meet their need. Peter certainly didn't like the fact that Jesus was stooping on his own knees to wash their feet. Stooping to the role of the household slave. He didn't think that was appropriate. Sometimes when we try to help offer biblical advice or biblical counsel to someone, we hear back from them, oh, that won't work. Or maybe the truth that you had to confront them with, and you did so gently and lovingly and humbly, they didn't want to hear because they don't like the implication of that truth. That's not what they want to hear. Sometimes people are hurting so badly, they're so desperate that they resist those that are genuinely seeking to offer them truth. Those who are genuinely trying to help them. If you've ever seen or talked to or maybe been yourself a lifeguard, and they go in to rescue someone who's drowning, and the person who's drowning is trying to get out and keep their head above water, and they, they often do more harm than good because they're working against the lifeguard rather than letting the lifeguard rescue them. And the lifeguards have to try to calm them down quickly so they can get a hold of them and help them in the way they need to be helped. Friends, we must, like Jesus, yes, we try to explain, but we realize we, as in our attempts to help and serve people to meet their needs, sometimes they may not understand it for a while, just like Peter didn't understand it. But just because we might be misunderstood must not keep us from serving those in need and those whom God has put us in their path to meet that need. So then let's notice last, serving is modeling Christ's likeness. Look at verse 12. When he had washed their feet, he put on his outer garments and resumed his place. Do you understand what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, what Jesus has done here is he has demonstrated that 
true greatness in His kingdom, which is the kingdom that matters, this is what it looks like. It looks like humble service. That, that doesn't fit the kingdom today, what true greatness looks like. True greatness today is about making a name for yourself, blasting other people so that you can be made to look higher and thought well of by other people and getting people to praise you. It is rampant in our society. But Jesus said, no, true greatness in the one kingdom that's going to last, the one kingdom that matters, is lowly, humble service. You see, Jesus regarded lowly service to others as an honorable act. And this was a blow to the pride of the disciples, and if we're honest, a blow to ours as well. He said, guys, this is an example that you should follow. I, your Lord and your teacher, have stooped to wash your feet. You do the same for others. This is an example for how to serve other people. Some churches, some denominations take this to mean that we should actually physically wash other people's feet as a regular ongoing thing. I don't personally see it that way for two reasons. I won't stop them from do it or argue with them do it. Here's why I don't. Number one, I think Jesus was demonstrating their need of regular cleansing by him. Cleansing by Him so that we can share in fellowship with Him because sin crops up in our lives on a constant basis. And we've got to have that sin cleansed. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is all about. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us that sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Yes, we're children of God, but we still have the sinful nature and we still sin. And that sin... It doesn't negate the relationship with him, but it hampers our fellowship with him. And we need to be cleansed with that so we can have fellowship, just like eating around a table. He's showing, yes, we need regular cleansing by him. And if it gets to washing somebody else's feet, then the cleansing comes from somebody else rather than from Christ. I'm not saying there's never a time to wash somebody else. They're in, unable to do it, and you can serve them in that way? Great. I just don't think it needs to be a ritual or routine in a church setting, hopefully they washed them at least within the week before they came, right? It's not a, it's not a practical need they had. We, we wear shoes. We don't walk on dusty streets to get here. That was a practical, and that's the second thing. Jesus was meeting a practical need in that culture. That's not a need you and I have in our culture today. The overarching lesson was an example of humble service to one another. His focus was not on the foot washing per se, but it was the attitude of humility that sees a need that no one is meeting, and I'm willing to meet that need. So let us remember, we cannot stoop too low. No one is so low that we cannot or should not serve them. That's the lesson here. I mean, think of the people whose feet he washed. A denier, a betrayer, and ten deserters. Not one of them was going to stand with him that night. And he washed them all. No one is too low for us to meet their need in service. That's what Jesus is saying we're to do. Just like I have served you, you are to serve others. And they're are multiple ways, multiple ways that we can meet practical needs for those in the body of Christ and those outside of the body of Christ. That we can follow Christ's examples. F.B. Meyer said the only hope of a decreasing self, and that's what we all need, a decreasing self. The only hope of a decreasing self is an increasing Christ. John the Baptist said in John 3, 3 and verse 30, He must increase and I must decrease. And the only hope we have of our decreasing is for us to have an increasing view of Christ. How we need the mind of Christ who humbled himself, who took on the role of a servant and was obedient to death, as we read in Philippians 2. And then Jesus says, If you know these things, Blessed are you if you do them. He doesn't say 
You're blessed if you know these things. He says you're blessed when you do them. And D.A. Carson said, Knowing without doing finds no sanctions anywhere in the teachings of Jesus. Friends, it's not enough to know. In fact, knowledge puffs up, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians. Knowing a lot of biblical facts just makes us proud. It's the doing where the rubber meets the road. The Apostle John would write in 1 John 2, 6, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner that he walked, and the manner was humble service. When we stoop to serve, we are walking the way Christ walked. We are pointing people to him, and we are identifying ourselves as his disciples. But let me be quick to say the opposite is also true. When we refuse to serve, when serving is not our pattern, when that's not what we are known for as a regular pattern of serving others and serving Christ, we are identifying ourselves that we do not belong to Him. Perhaps you've heard the uh, expression, the saying, He who dies with the most toys wins. You've heard that common thing in our society today? Get everything you deserve Whatever makes you happy, he who dies with the most toys wins. I'd like to adapt it, and this isn't original with me either. He who dies with the dirtiest towel wins. Because the dirty towel indicates a pattern of humble, consistent service. And therein we follow the example of our Lord our Savior, our King, Jesus Christ. He who dies with the dirtiest towel ultimately wins because he's blessed. That's what Jesus said. If you know these things, what? Humble service. You're blessed when you do them. That is the winning recipe, humble service. So let's ask a couple of questions. What obstacles keep me from serving? Is it my pride? I'm, that's beneath me. I, I, I can't stoop to that. I won't stoop to that. It's beneath me. Is it my pride? Is it just my busyness? I, my, my schedule is so busy that there, aren't, there isn't time for me to step aside and to serve people and meet needs. It's not for not seeing them. I, I just don't have the time. Friends, if they, you don't have the time, then something's wrong with your priorities. Jesus came here, he knew he had a limited time here on earth, he had a specific mission to accomplish, and yet his whole, whole life was service. Maybe it's because you're just not being sensitive to the needs of others. Your, your, your focus is so much on yourself that you don't even see the needs of others, let alone have the time or desire to do something about it. What? Be honest with yourself. God knows you're not going to fool him. What obstacles are keeping me from serving? Well, I just don't really like that, or it's not very comfortable. It it pushes me outside of my comfort zone to do that. i got other things I'd rather be doing. You're revealing your heart. God knows it. (laughs) You're not fooling him, but he's showing you what's in your heart. How do I respond when people misunderstand my service? Best I know how, and walk in obedience with Christ. I'm trying to point others to Christ and how they need to grow and the steps they need to take in their various situations, and, and it just isn't well received. Like Jesus with Peter here. Peter, Peter wasn't up for Jesus doing that because he totally misunderstood and combined with guilt that he wasn't down there doing Jesus' feet. You say, well, if that's the way you're going to be, then fine. I'll just leave you to your devices. You might not say that, but you might feel that and act that way by just walking away and not doing anything. Or do you understand these people still need Jesus? They need to be pointed to Jesus, and so you patiently, lovingly do it as they allow you to. You don't get belligerent in their face and try to force it down them. That's not going to do any good. You can pray for them, and you can still be there with them and assure them that you still love them and care for them, even if they don't want to take the biblical truth you're trying to share with them in this moment. God's Spirit has to work in their hearts 
He's got to change them. You can't change them. How do I react when people try to serve me? Do I try to push them away? No, 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 no. You can't do that. I won't accept that. Friends, we all need help. And our pride gets in the way when we don't want to accept help. Now, there is something to be said for doing stuff yourself, providing for yourself and for your family. We're told to do that. And Paul, in fact, Paul in Thessalonians says, hey, the guy that doesn't provide for his family is worse than an unbeliever. Okay, he doesn't mince words. We should be working and doing things to provide. We shouldn't be doing nothing and expect everybody to do everything for us. That's one wrong extreme. But the other wrong extreme is, I ain't going to take nothing from nobody. I can do it myself. And if we're not careful, we can be there. Jesus served, but he also allowed people to serve him. Mary and Martha, just to name a few. He didn't push them away and say, no, no, I'm not going to accept that. He gratefully allowed people to serve him. How do you react when people try to serve you? I read this a while back. A pastor from Pittsburgh relayed a conversation he had with a member of his church who said, You preachers talk a lot about do unto others, but when you get right down to it, it comes down to basin theology. The pastor said, Basin? Base in theology, what's that? And the church member replied, Remember when Pilate, when he had the chance to acquit Jesus, do you remember what he did? He called for a basin of water and washed his hands of the whole thing. I'm not having any more to do with it. I'm innocent. I don't have anything to do with this man. But Jesus, the night before his death, called for a basin and proceeded to wash the disciples' feet. It comes down to basin theology. Which one will you use? Let's pray together. Father, we are humbled. We're convicted. We're rebuked for ways and opportunities we could have served and we didn't. But that's where the glorious gospel of Christ shines hope. We don't have to live in the guilt, the defeat of those past moments of failure. We can right now, where we sit, seek your forgiveness. On the promise that when we confess our sins, we repent of our sins, you are faithful, you are just, and you forgive us for those failures and those sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and wipe the slate clean. And right now at roughly 12 o'clock on this Sunday afternoon, April the 14th, 2019, we can have a clean slate and we have opportunities this very afternoon to serve. It may be here, it may be someone else that needs love and compassion a helping hand, words of encouragement, or just our presence there with them. And we'll have other opportunities throughout the weeks to come and the days to come. May we not use the basin like Pilate did to absolve ourselves looking out for our own interests. May we use the basin like Jesus did to meet the most menial tasks, do the most menial jobs of humbly serving those around us. Because it was Jesus himself who said the way up is the way down. We must humble ourselves and then you will exalt us in due time. Lord, help us to follow his example. May we be consumed with Christ and Christ's kingdom and his agenda rather than our own kingdom, which will not last and is extremely small and insignificant. Lord, may we rather have Jesus than anything else this world offers us. We pray in his precious name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing in closing, I'd rather have Jesus. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather
said. Amen. God bless you.